Carl, can you hear me at the back? Right. Well, first of all, I want to thank Carol. Her commitment to our community is such an inspiration to all of us. Carol, thank you. And thanks to all of you, all of you for coming out tonight. You've been so, so, so generous with me on the doorstep. You know, you fed me so many sweets and poured so many cups of coffees down my throat that I haven't slept in weeks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got my support in both of you. <laughs> my friends, we're all here because we love Victoria. It's a city of diversity, a city of commitment, a city where young people have the opportunity to realize their full potential, where arts and culture thrive, where activism and fighting for change is part of the very DNA of this community, and where we take care of our environment, our coast, and indeed where we take care of each other. We are at our best when we harness that caring spirit, and friends, I want to take that spirit to Ottawa. Right on. When I moved here 35 years ago, I fell in love with this place. In fact, I met my wife Linda here at one of the founding uh, meetings of the Wilderness Committee. As a young law professor, I was inspired by the students at UVic, and a whole new generation of young activists continues to graduate each year from that university, that fine university. I'm here today because I want to make a difference in our world. My passion for protecting the environment grew here in Victoria. In fact, that passion is the very reason why I started a law firm with my great friend Joe Arve. I got into law to fight for progressive values, for new Democrat values. My passion is driven not by what's wrong with our country, but how we can make Canada an even better country. Yeah! A Canada that's more fair, a Canada that's more equal, a Canada where it doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, where you can succeed like everyone else in this country. That's the vision that I have for this country. As a lawyer, I fought for the rights of same-sex couples to legally marry in this province, and we won that fight. Yeah! visited every First Nation community on Vancouver Island and seen firsthand the kind of struggles they have and the kind of change that's required in this country to move forward together. I worked for the NDP government negotiating lasting treaties with First Nation in an attempt to achieve true reconciliation. And when someone named Gordon Campbell decided to take on the NISCA treaty, well we took him on and we won. I founded the BC Public Interest Advocacy Centre, which continues to fight for the rights of underprivileged immigrant farm workers and indeed the underprivileged community uh, in, in general. And I am so honoured that Adrian Dix asked me to lead his legal team to stop the Enbridge pipeline. And friends, we will stop that pipeline! our resources and our jobs. 
You know, Stephen Harper once famously said that you wouldn't recognize Canada when I'm through with it. <laughs> well, you know, that's one promise he's kept. <laughs> but friends, you, do you Democrats are working even harder to stop him. Mr. Harper, under the leadership of Tom Mulcair, we're standing up to your reckless agenda here in Victoria and right across this country. Mr. Harper, we're going to take you on, and you know something? We are going to win. Yeah. 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 Last year, I watched with huge pride as voters all across the country voted for change. For the first time ever, voters gave Canada an NDP official opposition. The NDP brought together people from all walks of life in both official languages, and we formed a new coalition, a progressive, united alternative. From Soup to St. John's, from Shakutami to the Chilcotin, new Democrats are standing up for hardworking Canadians. And here in Victoria, here in Victoria, Denise Savoy got elected and got re-elected. Why? Because Victorians knew they could count on her to fight for our values in Victoria. Yeah! I know that I've got very big, big shoes to fill. Don't I know it? But friends, I'm up to the job. I want to be part of Tom Mulcair's New Democratic team in Ottawa so that we can fight Stephen Harper his decision to raise the retirement age to 65. So that we can tell him, 67, did I say 65? Yeah. <laughs> Two more years. Don't worry. Does that mean that people we all who have are, dyslexia who sometimes. We're working yeah. at manual labor uh, uh, opportunities like that. And you just think of what that actually could mean in real people's lives. Like here on the doorstep, sounds so easy. We're 67 is, you know, two more years. And what's the cost in working people's pockets of those two additional years? You know, I want to stand up and tell them we don't want more fighter jets. You know, we want we want more doctors and we want more nurses. Right on! And a few spaceships wouldn't hurt either. And when Stephen Harper's friend here in Victoria, someone called Christy Clark, attacks the Canada Health Act, there will be someone in Ottawa to stand up and demand that the federal government enforce the Canada Health Act. Right on! Here, here! A year ago, our nation mourned the loss of our great friend, Jack Layton. What Jack managed to achieve is absolutely extraordinary. He united progressive voters from coast to coast to coast. Now it's up to us to continue his legacy. Since becoming leader of the NDP earlier, uh, uh, earlier this year, Tom Mulcair has continued that legacy. He's built upon the work that Jack started and done so, so successfully. He is now leading the largest opposition in the last 30 years. And he's showing Canadians what a real opposition can do. Yeah!
Working together, we will fight for a national, affordable, accessible childcare strategy. <laughs> Working together, we will always continue to fight for a national Medicare system that works for Canadians. We want to ensure that our children have the skills necessary for the jobs of tomorrow. My friends, Stephen Harper's days as Prime Minister are numbered. Yeah. We are going to show him the kind of change that Canadians want starting now. So today, I'm asking for your support. On November the 26th, I'm asking for your vote. I'm asking you to help me and Tom Mulcair to take on Stephen Harper. So friends, knock on doors, talk to your neighbors, pound in those, line, those lawn signs everywhere, and join with us. We need your help because we will defeat the Conservatives. We will get the job done. And the next Prime Minister of Canada, the prochain Prime Minister du Canada, mon ami, my friend, Tom Mulcair. Bravo, Tom! Let's stand there, Tom. Victoria. And we're all here for the same reason. We understand what this by-election is about. By-elections are really important. Look what Aiden Lake's <coughs> accomplished here in BC last year, picking up those two <coughs> I want to thank Carol James for that great introduction of, of Murray, our next member of Parliament for Victoria. <coughs> Randall Garrison, who was out at Esquimalt with us this afternoon, visiting that extraordinary installation. There is hope. Things can be done right, and you're really an example of it here. But across Canada, we're living with the reality of the Harper government. Mr. Harper has told us that we have to start living with less. That somehow all of the services and institutions we've built up in this country over the past 50 years are no longer affordable. Look back. We've had 50 years of constant economic growth in our country. The Conservatives have got very good branding on the economy, by the way. That's one of the places where we're going to have to be really solid heading into the next election. That's why Murray Rankin's election is so important to us. But look at what's being lost and why. The Conservatives have tried to convince us that $50 billion of tax reductions for Canada's richest corporations is the formula to let the free market reign and get companies... What in free market? What's happened instead? <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Listen to Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of Canada. He says there's $500 billion of dead money sitting there because companies aren't investing in Canada. Why are companies not investing in Canada? Because they don't have faith in their government. And what's happening right now is for the first time in Canadian history, a whole generation is earning less than the generation just before. That to us is unacceptable, and that will change. Right on. Listen carefully to what Stephen Harper says. You don't have to interpret after promising not to touch health care, by the way, if you're a fan of politics, go online, pull up answer, June 7th and 8th, 2011, five weeks after the election. Some of the last questions Jack Lee asked in the House of Commons. Two specific questions. Mr. Harper, are you going to cut health care? Answer, we will not cut health care. 
same year, December 2011, not quite a year ago, at a meeting of his provincial counterparts, Jim Flaherty announced sometime between his coffee and his piece of pie, because it was not even on the agenda, he said it at lunch, that if they are re-elected in 2015, starting right after that, in 2016, they will remove $36 billion from the projected transfers in health care. Same. Fifty years ago, following Tommy Douglas's model in Saskatchewan, we decided in Canada, as a reflection of our fundamental goodness and our ability and our willingness to care for each other, that no Canadian family should ever have to choose between having a sick child seen by a doctor and being able to put food on the table. Yeah. Country. 
but we want prosperity for all Canadians. Yeah. You know, the Conservatives don't like it when we say that their tax breaks only benefited the richest corporations, but look at what they did. If you're in the manufacturing sector, and Canada has lost 500,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs in the last 10 years, most of them under conservative law. If you're in that sector and you're breaking even or you're losing money, you know what you got out of a tax reduction? Zero, because you weren't paying taxes. Who got that money? The banks and the oil companies, principally. The same oil companies that were subsidizing to cause some of the worst pollution in Canada. They're being allowed to use our air, our soil, and our water as an unlimited free dumping ground. That's an ecological debt we're leaving on future generations. We're leaving them a large economic debt year over year, the largest deficits. But we're also leaving them a social debt in their backpacks. Because when those people who have lost those good paying manufacturing jobs that came with a pension wind up with part time work in the service sector and not enough for a family to live on and no pension, when they come to retirement, they're supposed to take care of them, the next generation. So they're going to be saddled with a social debt as well. These are the same conservatives who like to say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't look for a handout. You still pull on it. <laughs> We're living off the credit card of our grandchildren. I get to say that now that I'm a grandfather. That's the conservative way. Talk, preach out of one side of the mouth. Actions are completely different. This is where we come in. We actually believe that things like the wheat board, which were created to give working farming families in the prairies at even break, not to be completely at the whim of the market or the weather. Things like supply management. Supply management is on the table in the trade deal for the Pacific that's being discussed right now. Supply management gave Canadian farming families in dairy, poultry, and eggs an even break. We didn't see large multinationals moving in the minute there was a problem with the market or a change. We protected our farming families. They've been at it for generations and generations, and we should be proud of these institutions. We've got to understand their nature and their importance, and we've got to stand up and fight to defend them. Right on! That's where you come in. That's where we come in. Because unlike the liberals who signed Kyoto, as a public relations stunt. They were always very good at flashing left and turning right. But that's yeah. What, that's what right on. Don't take my word for it. Google two words. Google the word galvanize and the word Goldenberg. Eddie Goldenberg was John Peyton's chief of staff. And in a speech before the London Economic Club in March, February, March of 2007, he said this. And when the Liberals signed Kyoto, they did it, quote, to galvanize public opinion. They had no way of reaching the goals and the targets of Kyoto. In other words, they never really had a plan, which must explain why they went on to have one of the worst records in the world in terms of greenhouse gas production. That's the liberal way. Tell people what they think they want to hear and then do whatever they want once they're in power. Look at someone like Murray Rankin, the credibility that he brings to the job. He hasn't just talked about the environment. He's acted on the environment. He will be a strong voice for sustainable development. He'll be a part of an incredible team of women and men who will fairly beam forth to all Canadians our confidence and our competence to assume the administration of a complex economy like that in this country. And that's how we're going to get rid of Stephen Harper, by convincing Canadians we can get the job done. Right on! Progressives of all stripes under the NDP banner. 
rally everyone who shares our vision and our goals and make them understand that the only way to get rid of Stephen Harper is to elect an NDP government, and that includes getting Murray Rankin elected here in Victoria. Yeah.